Hi, it's Keely. Welcome to Riverside Online. If you're here for the first time, then it's really great to have you with us and we hope you enjoy today's service. Well, Riverside Cafe will be opening tomorrow from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. Monday to Friday and we are really excited about that. Uh, as you know, I uh, said last week, we decided to stay with the two metre distancing, social distancing rule, and that's really to just create that safe space for you and the community to come and reconnect with us. But can I just remind everybody that at the moment, the government guidelines are that it's just two families or two bubbles that can meet together indoors. And that does include cafes, bars and restaurants. So please be mindful of that when you're making your arrangements. So much work has gone into getting the cafe ready. Uh, we've had to write new policies, look at risk assessments, buy new equipment, look at different ways of working. And uh, Jackie has been incredible in making sure that we are ready for our opening tomorrow. So thank you, Jackie. But as always, it's never just one person. So I also want to thank Kim and Martin and Lydia, who's been in, but also Alan, who's Jackie's husband, Alan King, you'll know him. Uh, he's been coming in all over lockdown most days to pat test all our equipment, mend what needs mending, sort the whole area out and move our till right to the end. All of that's been a lot of hard work and we're really grateful, Alan, for everything that you've given. Everything we do at Riverside is because we have an amazing team behind us and working with us. So I just want to thank everybody who works so often behind the scenes really hard. Thank you so much for all you do. A Grow Baby is one of our ministries at Riverside where we help vulnerable families or those who need a little bit of extra help with baby clothes or equipment. And over the last few months, there's been a lot going on. I've asked Casey to share a little bit of her story and tell us how we've been serving the community. Hi, everyone. For those people that don't know me, I'm Casey Honeysett. Um, and here I am just to tell you a bit about what's going on with Grow Baby at the moment um, and how I've ended up being in this position of being team leader. Uh, and it all starts at the beginning of the year um, when I sort of was at church one Sunday and they were asking for volunteers for Grow Baby and I did decide that I was going to volunteer one Monday, which I did. And um, I absolutely loved it. I had um, such an immense feeling of joy being able to support the families, getting together all the packages of baby clothes. Um, and I just, yeah, I absolutely loved it. And um, sort of the next week I decided to get together with Kath for a coffee. And um, for those of you that don't know, Kath was the team leader for Grow Baby. And I was telling her about how much I absolutely loved Grow Baby. And unbeknown to me, Kath was having this sort of experience um, where she was feeling God was leading her in a different direction and was sort of wondering, oh my goodness, who's going to take over from Grow Baby? And um, I think that particular day, Keely came to join us as well and the three of us were sitting down and I was saying, oh my goodness, I absolutely love Grow Baby. Kath was thinking, oh, I'm feeling like I'm being drawn to something else. And um, it was almost like an exchange happened. It just seemed like the most natural thing for me to be taking over the position that Kath was you know, being led away from. Um, and basically that's what was happening. Um, and then lockdown came and everything stopped. Um, I was obviously at home for, for a while. Um, and then Keely called me in when uh, sort of it got a bit too much for Kim um, and I've been using this opportunity to have a massive sort out uh, in the Grow Baby room um, and in phase three where we have lots and lots of stuff so doing a massive sort out and at the same time we've been having uh, lots of referrals from social services so helping putting packages together for clients who would usually come in on a Monday they've been um, collected sort of uh, quite a few times during the week and um, we had a situation last uh, week where three families uh, needed prams uh, and we only had four so by the end of the day we'd actually blessed three families with three prams and when I left I was thinking oh my goodness we've literally hardly got any prams left so I thought I'd put a shout out on the Grey Baby Facebook page asking if there could be any donations and then when I came in on Monday this week, three prams have come back in um, for us to, to bless more families with. So that's just absolutely incredible. So 
Uh, it's uh, an amazing pleasure to be in this position. I'm absolutely loving it. Thank you, Casey. It's really great to hear about all that's going on with Grow Baby. And a big shout out to Lily, who's been coming in with you. Uh, Lily is Casey's daughter, and it's been lovely to have her at Riverside. She's been helping with all the sorting. And yeah, thank you, Lily. You're amazing. In a moment, Mark and Rachel will be leading us in a time of sung worship, and then Jake will continue our series in Philippians. After the talk, Martin will be sharing with us and then we'll take communion together. So if you haven't got any food or drink, then maybe you want to grab some quickly. Before we worship together, I'm going to read from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Amen. Thank you. 
never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
Good morning. Let's pray before we start. Lord, I just pray that you speak to us this morning as we look in the book of Philippians, Lord. Let us learn more of who you are and let us learn how we can win the battle of our minds. In Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if this is a bit of a weird thing, but I love a car boot sale. I absolutely love them and I always have. As a child, I remember there was a period of a couple of months where every Saturday we went to a car boot sale. And there's two main reasons why I love car boot sales. Firstly, the reason is that you see such a weird variety of things at a car boot sale. When you go in front of each car in their little stalls, you can go from seeing fashion that has been completely out of fashion for the last 30 years, but might just make its comeback, to moving to the next stall and seeing um, some videos that aren't even used anymore, where hardly anyone knows how to use a video. And it's so fun going to see all these different weird things at each stall. And I remember when I was younger and we were going to these car boot sales quite regularly for a bit of fun, I remember collecting these musical animals. Now it might seem a bit of a weird thing to collect and looking back, yeah, it was a bit of a weird thing to collect, but I would go to each stall and look to see if they had an animal that you could play music with. So for example, I had one frog that you had a stick and when you um, flicked the stick over the back of the frog, it would make a rabbit sound. And then I also had a flute type instrument that was shaped like a bird. I loved these weird things that you could buy in a car boot sale, but 
my main reason for loving a car boot sale as an 11 year old boy. And it's probably a weird hobby for an 11 year old, but I loved negotiating. I loved knowing that I can see this old football top from 50 years ago that's priced at 20 pounds and I could go in and bargain it down to 12 pounds and go away with feeling like I've made a steal. I don't think many 11 year olds probably would have thought of bargaining or negotiating as their hobby, but I absolutely loved it. I loved feeling like I was able to get a bargain after I negotiated with the seller. And today we're going to look a little bit at negotiating. But we're not going to look at negotiating with somebody else. We're actually looking at negotiating with ourselves. Harvard professor Erica Fox says that the most important negotiations that we make every day are with ourselves. The most important negotiations that we make every day are with ourselves. At 7.30, you wake up and you know that you've got work at 8.30, but you're feeling so tired. Do I hit the snooze button and get 15 more minutes in bed, but risk turning up to work a little bit scruffy? Or do I make sure I get into work early, but be tired all day? And then I get into work. Do I bring up that awkward conversation that I need to have with my boss? Do I ask that awkward question? Or maybe there'll be a better time. Maybe another time I could do it. Maybe it's not right just now. I don't really want to do it. And then your boss comes up to you and she says to you, I've got a new project for you. But you're already so swamped with work. You've already got so much to do. Do I tell my boss that I'm too busy? Or do I say, okay, I'll take it, knowing that it might mean that you won't be able to get to dinner in time to be with your family? And then you have a fundraising. You've got to fundraise a certain amount and you're right near your target, but you're not quite there. But the biggest donor had said to you that if you didn't quite make the target, she was happy to top it up for you. She was happy to pay the extra amount, but you feel a bit awkward. They've already given so much towards this cause and you feel a bit too awkward to go back. Do you go back and embrace the awkward and ask for a little bit more money? Or do you decide, actually, I'm going to leave it? Every day we have a battle going on in our mind. How we're feeling about things, what we're thinking about things and how our mind is wanting us to act makes a difference on whether we step into opportunities or step away from opportunities. And sometimes your mind feels just that, it feels like a battle. Maybe you feel like there are things coming from all directions at your mind. Some things that you feel like you have to dodge and some things you have to grab onto. It feels like sometimes that there is a battle going on in our own mind. And studies have shown that this battle, this struggle with the mind is intensifying for the emerging generation. It's affecting them even more than it has affected people in the past. It's affecting a greater number of them. A study by the mental health charity Kintsugi Hope shows that one in five children have been diagnosed with mental health difficulty. One in five children have been diagnosed with mental health difficulty. And we know that during COVID-19, mental health has taken another big hit. In the same study, 83% of children who had been diagnosed with mental health issues had admitted that their mental health had worsened over the period of COVID-19 
because of isolation and because of lack of routine. And it's not just young people. We all have a battle on in our minds and COVID-19 has affected us all mentally in some way or another. Whether it's anxiety about the virus or whether it's um, feeling lonely, I believe that we've all had some kind of battle in our mind as we respond to coronavirus. And in today's passage, Paul talks about the battle of the mind. In today's passage, he talks about how we can overcome the battle of the mind and how we can win the battle of the mind. And he engages with this. Kim is going to read this passage for us now as Paul engages with this battle. Today's reading is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 9. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be ev evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul's desire for the church of Philippians is that they would walk in the peace of God. In verses two and three, Paul is pleading, he's almost begging these two ladies who were key church leaders in the church in Philippi to have one mind in Christ. Both these women were highly regarded by Paul and had a deep Christian faith that was rooted in love. But there seemed to be a serious disagreement between them about how the gospel should be practised within their church in Philippi. Paul pleads with them to return to a harmless position to a return to a place where they could work together as leaders of the church in Philippi. He pleads with them to walk together in peace. But Paul also knows that being in disagreement with someone else isn't the only way for us to feel like we're unable to walk in God's peace. We can be on good terms with everyone around us. We can have good relationships with lots of people, but still feel like we aren't able to walk in peace. Still feel like we're not able to walk in God's peace. And when we talk about peace, what we're talking about is God's best for you. The word used for peace in uh, scripture is shalom. And shalom, when someone would say shalom to someone, which they do still sometimes now, someone might say shalom to you. And what they mean by that is all of God's goodness and blessing be upon you. But often our mind can stop us from living in this peace, from living in God's best for us, for living in God's goodness and blessing. Worry and anxiety can overtake us and rob us 
from this peace. And in the passage today, I just picked out four tips that Paul has given us on how we can have this peace, how we can attain this peace, how we can overcome the battle of the mind and how we can live in God's best for us. So there's four tips on how we can do that that Paul sets out in this passage. The first tip is found in verse four. Verse four says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The first tip that Paul gives us to win the battle of the mind is rejoice. Now, on the surface, it seems a little unreasonable to be commanded to rejoice and even more unreasonable to be told to rejoice always. How can I rejoice when everything around me is rubbish and it's so constantly rubbish? How can I rejoice when I'm not feeling happy? How can I rejoice when I'm in this pit of misery? How can I rejoice when I'm not feeling like rejoicing, when I'm not feeling happy? Well, it gives me hope that the person telling us to rejoice isn't someone that's just lived a really, really comfortable, easy life saying, hey, why aren't you rejoicing? But instead, it is Paul, who even as he was writing this, was suffering. Who even as he was writing this, was in prison and was even facing death, facing execution. But he says, rejoice. So it's easy for us to rejoice when everything around us is good. It's easy for us to rejoice when everything seems fun, when everything seems happy, when everything seems joyful. But it's when things around you are tough, when things around you are rubbish, that's when rejoicing becomes a choice. See, happiness is a feeling, but praise and rejoicing is a choice. And it's not really a choice that we can just summon up ourselves. It's not really a choice that we can just work really hard to feel joyful, to be rejoicing, but it's a choice to say to the Holy Spirit, I need joy, give me joy, give me joy, and let me rejoice with you, let me praise you. Choosing to praise and to rejoice is an act of faith, and it is an act of trusting in God. And throughout scripture, we see that praise changes things. Praise unlocks something. Whether it's uh, the music of worship being played as the walls of Jericho fall, or whether it's Paul and Silas in the prison cells and have this worship party together and the prison doors fling open. When we praise, something changes, but it starts with an attitude of gratitude. And don't get me wrong, this isn't a call to pretend you're feeling good. It's not a call to always pretend you're happy. It's not a call to be someone that's not feeling it, but walks around, around with a big smile on their face all the time and just talks about clouds and rainbows. Be honest to God. Be honest with God about where you are, where you are at. But also be honest about who he is. The first tip that Paul gives us is rejoice. And the second tip that he gives us is do not worry. 
Verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not worry about anything. Now, I understand that being told do not worry can be a really annoying thing to be told. When you're in a place of worry, when you're feeling panicked, when you're feeling tense, being told don't worry is ridiculously frustrating. And most likely, all it's going to do is take you from a place of worrying to a place of worrying and wanting to smack someone around the face. So, what is the basis of which Paul is telling us not to worry? Well, it's found just before this command, just before he tells us do not worry, right at the end of verse five, he says, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. This is the basis of which we need not worry. He is for you, he loves you, and he is with you. The basis of which Paul is telling us not to worry is that with you, alongside you, and in you is a God who is powerful enough to create the universe at a click of the fingers and he protects you. A God who loves you so much that he would humble himself and join his creation, knowing that he would be crucified and then rose again so that you would always be protected. That not even death could part you from his protection and his love. So the first tip is to rejoice always. And the second tip is do not worry. And this is the third. Just after it says do not worry in verse six, it says, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. If in the last tip I explained the basis of which Paul is saying, do not worry. This tip is talk about how we can go about doing that. This tip is how we can most effectively let go of our worry. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7 says this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. When someone feels anxious, often physically they feel heavy. They feel like there's a heaviness maybe in their shoulders or in their chest that they can't quite shake. You can feel often weighed down in stress, in anxiety, in worry. And that is why I love Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. It says this, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is a beautiful picture of exchange. As you come to God with your heaviness, with your anxiety and with your worry, he's saying, lay it down at my feet. Lay it down at my feet, just like on the cross where he says, Give me your sin. He says, I will take your burdens. I will take your worry, your anxiety, and I will give you rest. Bring me your burdens. Bring me your anxiety, and I will give you rest. For you will take my easy yoke, and you will take my light burden. Bring your worries and your stresses.
before God. And he will exchange it for his light yoke, his light burdens and easy yoke. He's big enough to deal with the most complicated of your problems, most complicated of your anxiety, of your worry. He's got you and he is for you and he loves you. So the first tip is rejoice always. The second tip is do not worry. The third tip is in everything, bring prayer and petition to God. And then as we come into land, the final tip is fill your minds. Fill your minds with whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Fill your minds with whatever is true. Well, that means getting rid of any lies that you have believed about yourself. Anything that someone else has said about you and it's stuck with you and you haven't been able to shake it. Or anything that you've believed about yourself that is untrue. Get rid of it all. I'm not good enough. I'm not clever enough. I'm not beautiful enough. Get rid of it and swap those lies with truths spoken about you from scripture. That you are created in the image of God. That you are loved unconditionally and that God delights in you. Fill your minds with what is true. And then it says, fill your minds with what is pure. One of the tactics of the devil is to fill our life, to fill our mind with impurity. One of the biggest problems for this generation that are surrounded, that were brought up being surrounded by social media, by the internet on their phones, is that it's so easy for impurity to creep in. They're surrounded by pornography whether it's friends talking about it at school or TV normalising it or even social media advertising it. This impurity corrupts the mind. If we're trying to win the battle of our mind, if we're trying to let in God's peace to come upon us, if we're trying to get rid of um, the lies that are in our minds, Filling our minds with impurity is going to get in the way. Keeping our minds pure is vital for the battle of the mind. And I love this. I love that it says whatever is lovely because the literal translation is amazing. The literal translation of these few verses is whatever calls forth love. Fill your minds with whatever calls forth love. Focus on these things. Focus on God's love. Try not to focus too much on the pain and the insecurity, but on the things that bring joy. Focus on who God is. Focus on love. Focus on what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is lovely, and what is admirable. So these are the four tips that Paul gives us in this passage. Rejoice always. Do not worry. Bring prayer and petition to God and fill your minds. And what is the result, according to Paul, in doing these things? Well, it says in verse 7. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, the shalom, walking in God's goodness, that is what you will attain if you put into practice these things. 
In fact, it says peace that passes all understanding. And this is what Paul's got, right? He's in prison. He's facing death. His friends are suffering. Yet, for some reason, he's got peace. It doesn't make any sense. But this is a peace that goes beyond circumstances and feelings. It's a peace that is greater than our circumstance. And that's why it passes all understanding. And how is it that we can get given this peace? Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus came to transform a world of chaos and hate to be filled with peace and his love. His death and resurrection was always the plan to bring peace to a world that needed peace, a world of chaos, that death would have no hold on us, that we would be able to take his easy yoke and his light burden. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Paul's writings here. Thank you for these tips on how we can win the battle of the mind so that our focus could be on you, so that we could attain the peace of God. And we pray that we'll be people that are able to get rid of the lies that we have thought about ourselves, the lies that we haven't been able to shake off, Lord, and that we will remember your truth. Lord, I pray that we'll be able to rejoice always. I pray that we will be able to not worry. I pray that we'll be able to bring everything to you in prayer. And Lord, I just pray that we will be a people that are able to fill our minds with what you say about us. And Lord, I wanna pray for anyone who right now is really feeling the Holy Spirit speak to them. Anyone that's been feeling really anxious, that's been feeling full of worry where their situation is getting the better of them. And if that's you right now, I want to encourage you to picture yourself walking into the throne room of God and place your worry, place your anxiety, place any lies that you've believed about yourself in front of his feet. And God says, I will take them from you and he will give you his easy yoke, and his light burdens. Lord, I pray that we'll be able to walk in your peace, in your goodness, in what you have best for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Martin's going to lead us now into a time of communion. And if this is you, if this is you that is feeling this battle of their mind intensely, someone that's feeling this anxiety getting in the way that's robbing you of joy, I want to encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit to be with you and to ask God to meet with you as you take this communion. As we look at the exchange that Jesus did on the cross, we also take the offer of the exchange of the anxiety and burdens with the easy yoke and the light burdens. Amen. Thanks, Jacob. I hope you're prepared to share in communion in a little while. How has your week been? Have you been anxious? Have you been worried? You've been sad, you've been happy. I should imagine probably a mixture of all those things. For me, this week, yeah, it's been all those things. Term has finished for me at King's. 
But it's not just term that's finished. I've actually come to the end of my 30 years of teaching at King's. I've taken voluntary redundancy. Am I anxious? Yeah, I have been a little anxious at times. I've been sad at times, and I've been happy at times. But as I look back, I realise the Lord has been preparing my heart this year for this move. There's no more marking and reports. That's made me happy. No more, no more pupils. That's made me sad, mostly. No more long holidays. That's sad. No more weekend working. That's good news. I'm able to stay longer at Riverside and I don't have to say to my team or the team, I'm sorry I've got to go to school now to teach. That's made me happy. So happy, happy, not sad, happy. God has definitely prepared me for this change. And that's a change I thought would never happen. And I've also this week been reflecting on leading communion with you today. And on the passage that Jacob preached on, anxiety. And as I reflected on communion, I thought, is communion a happy time? Is it a sad time? Certainly when I was growing up, there were lots of serious, solemn faces. But I also remember times of celebration and joy at communion. Because remembering that our sins is forgiven is a joyous thing. As a teacher, no, as a former teacher, I would often use object lessons. I'm a visual learner and for my pupils, they were often visual learners. And as Chris did last week, we tend to remember things visually as well as if we hear them. I'm sure you can remember the example of the boxes that Chris used last week. And Jesus, properly, probably the greatest teacher of all time. He was very good at using object lessons. And that's exactly what this communion service is. It's an object lesson. Can you imagine the Last Supper? Jesus was sitting there with his disciples having a meal. Jesus breaks the bread and passes it round. And as he does, as he does so, he says, this is my body, broken. It's going to be broken for you. As you eat this, remember that. I wonder what sort of impact that would have had on the disciples. And then a little bit later on, he passed the glass of wine around. And he said to his disciples, come on, drink this. And as they drank it, he said, and this is my blood that's going to be poured out. It's going to be spilt for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, that was certainly a meal to remember. And it was remembered. And it continues to be remembered. And was possibly the most well-known and most powerful object lesson in history. Does communion save us? No. But it points to Jesus. And it's Jesus and what is done for us that saves us. Jesus losing his life for us so that we might enter into a relationship with him. We might have our sins forgiven. That's what it points towards. So is it happy? Or is it a sad occasion? Well, the reality is it's bittersweet. It's happy and sad at the same time. But if we're right with God, there's no need to be anxious. It's time now to repeat that object lesson. So as Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you are faithful and quick to forgive our sins and that once more we are in right relationship with you. We ask that you will help us to remain close to you this week. May we be salt and light to our family, friends and neighbours and show your love to all those who come into socially distant contact with us. May we be your hands and your feet, ready, willing and quick to serve our community. May we be people who are able to bring hope in these difficult times. And at the end of this week, may our relationship with you be stronger and deeper. And may there be less of me and more of you in my life. Amen. We're now going to enter a time of worship. You are the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name 